Hello everyone and welcome to episode of the Pregnant Head Hack podcast number 18. I have a very special guest for you today. It is Ellen Sentier. And let me read out to you how Ellen describes herself. Um, I was born on the dark moor and grew up on the Exmoor. My parents, family and the old ones in the villages where I grew up led me into the old ways of Britain. My mother's mother was a witch from the Isle of Man and my father was a... Uh, I need your help with the pronunciation, Ellen. And I cannot remember the word. <laughs> I father would. How is that? Kivarowicz. Kivarowicz. Suharuch. Kivarowicz. Yeah, with, tale... a, with a K sound. It meaning storyteller. Storyteller. Tale yeah. weaver. And um, Owenith. How is that pronounced? Owenith. 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 So a bit shaman who lived in Devon. So I was born into an old family of cunning folk. I pass on the old ways through writing books on British native shamanism and in magic, mystery, romance novels. I also offer training in the old British ways. I'm a wilderness woman at heart, couldn't cope with living in a village left alone, a town or city. So I live with my cats, husband and a host of wildlife in the back of beyond in the Welsh marshes. It's a magical twilight place between two countries and between two worlds. Okay, and I think we have many things in common. Welcome to the show. Um, how would you like to introduce yourself? And I'm sorry I didn't check the pronunciation of those words with you. That's not a problem. Um, I would be just as bad if I was trying to speak Swedish or Finnish. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly if I was having a go at Norse, <laughs> it'd be hopeless. Um, well, if you don't know me, I'm afraid I'm absolutely wild. And um, I enjoy being out in the wild. I enjoy the company of animals, particularly uh, large wolfish type creatures and cats. And um, I teach, which I love because the students are fantastic. And I learn so much from my students. Mm -hmm. And I love writing and I love writing the stories because um as Imelda will know you when you write a story you live the story oh yes and it's such fun and I gather that the books that I write to help people with they're only sort of little books um to help people with the old magic ways apparently they help people too and I like that yeah isn't that wonderful to be making a contribution this way so I think what we have in common is that we're both in our own way sort of wild women. And yep. um, so we decided to dedicate this podcast to the topic of free wilding, like what it means to be wild and what it means working in those areas where maybe we need to reclaim certain virgin territories in ourselves and sort of wild them or rewild them. But before we talk about that fascinating topic, you made the suggestion, uh, you know, we both work with the runes and we love them. We were just having a conversation about the runes offline. Um, and you suggested that we open this podcast by playing a part of the song All Gear, about rune All Gears, or commonly called, by Bart Runa. So are you happy for me to bring that up and play it up, just to give our audience a taste and also to show them, I mean, enjoy those images. Make sure you're not just listening, make sure this is a video podcast. Make sure you're watching, these images are amazing. So let's try and do that. Make it a bit bigger as well, so people, people can see what goes on. So here we go. We present Thank you. 
there and you can find this on YouTube. We will put a link uh, below this video in the show notes and you can watch the whole thing but isn't that just gorgeous? I feel so much at home just watching that. I do too and I've never been there yet um, but that is sort of like yeah I remember that. I remember living there. Yeah. I I love too that when the, the, the boy and his father presumably come and they meet the wood woes, we call that the wood spirit, that the wood woes. And he is. And he moves, it, takes his mask, and I'm here with you, but I'm also in the wood. Mm -hmm. And it was like, whoa, yeah, yeah, I love that. It's really beautiful. And I love that this video has that meeting with, you know, with the wild spirit, the wood spirit. And I know that in different, you and I work in different traditions. So these beings are going to have different names in different traditions. But what always strikes me when I do research is they exist in all traditions. And then, you know, people will sort of say, oh, these beings do not exist. It's like, I always wonder why would they be documented in all world traditions, even places that were not in contact with each other. We find very similar descriptions, but even just from an academic point of view, like, you know, why would it be so documented? Why would it be, why would it be so deeply wired into the human psyche if these beings really didn't exist? So to me, that's a nonsense argument. It is to me too, but I can understand it because we are so citified now. Humans yeah. are largely so citified. And to most people, if they met that being in the wood, or if they actually were lucky enough to meet a wolf, I mean, I even have people being nervous of crows coming close to them when they come out here to Shropshire to me. And um, it's just like, oh, for me, you are there. But then, I grew up with it. You grew up with it. So well, I suspect I, this certification is not going to help with rewilding. No. So, but maybe define that then. Would you define for us what is rewilding? Would you explain what we mean by that? Well, for me, um, and this is looking at history and archaeology as well, 
humans are the youngest species on planet Earth. Yep. Everything else is older than us. When you get down to things like viruses and fungi, yep. they are absolutely ancient, stunningly ancient. And I feel that we tend very much to act, particularly in the last two or three hundred years, like the idiotic, angry teenager hanging out on, on the street corner. And we don't want to be involved. We're afraid of being involved. And that's what has happened to us because we don't meet nature every day. We don't share our food with the natural world. We don't share our air. We don't breathe the same air. We don't go there. Um, I think we've, we've totally disconnected. And to be wild, you need to reconnect. And that means you have to change your attitude inside. And this is what I'm bringing, what I bring into my own teaching is you are not the pinnacle of creation. And in all shamanism all around the world, and shaman is, is a, a tungus word. It's not a, a universal word. We all call ourselves different. <laughs> but in shamanism, you learn from your elders. And your elder is the oak tree beside you, is the wolf in the forest, is the cat that you're speaking to, maybe even sitting on your lap, but she's older than you. And the crow, and the robin, and the fish, and the insects. And you can go and learn from all of those. And that to me is rewilding. And also you, you share with them. That's the other thing. We had to talk about this, didn't we? About what do you exchange with somebody when you when you you know you go to them when you go to the shop and you buy a, a pound of potatoes or something you exchange the money for the potatoes unlikely that the greengrocer is going to be able to take any other kind of exchange for you i could offer him a book and he go no nah, i can't pay the rent with the book um so you offer an exchange but what exchange do we offer the natural world for mm -hmm. giving us our food Yeah. That's stealing my corn. That's stealing my potatoes. That's eating my sheep. I'm not going to exchange with it. I'm going to kill it. And that is the attitude we need to change. That we can share with everything. Yeah, and also that we owe gratitude to everything. That we can communicate with everything. And that we cannot just assume that everything is going to be there for us if we are not in the right relationship with it. And that's why I think it's so important that we're having this conversation today. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to go back to the title of the song for a moment. The song we're just listening to is called Algir. That is the old Norse uh, version. Uh, you know, if you've studied the runes, people in the audience, uh, you would call the rune Algis. But there are things that go on in old Norse over time uh, you have different sound values. So Algir is Algis, um, as you will meet the rune on a rune magician course. Um, and shall I just bring up a picture of that rune for those people who've never yes, worked with the runes? I have a file here somewhere. Let's see. Uh, this can go down now. Um, where are the pictures? I need to bring that up. I had loaded it and then I had clicked it away to see something else. So one moment. Mm, where are we? Um, it's on the USB drive. Okay, right. So come up now. Some pictures. So right here. Okay. Um, so load that. Oh no, I need to. Need to bring it up here first. Okay. Where are we now? Oh, doesn't come up yet. Hang on. No, 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 no. 
I'm actually struggling with this. I'm sorry, let's try one more time. Here it is now. Okay. So this is Rune Aldis. And yeah. Ellen, would you tell us about Rune Aldis? And if we both work with the runes and we both teach the runes. Oh, I'm not a rune expert. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm talking straight from, from my guts with this one. The best kind of talk? Hope so. Oh, choices. Here is the way. It's reminding me of what we call Ellen's deer trods. We follow the deer trods, which is very, very ancient. Humans have followed the deer trods all their lives, ever since they've been humans. And this is following the way. Um, am I able to use my, is my pointer working? No, uh, no don't worry, don't worry. Starting at the bottom for me, it is, you know, you start off on your path and that's it. And you're going up your path and there aren't any side roads. And then you come to the crossroads. And you could go straight on. Or you could go right. Or you could go left. And you have a choice. And to, for me, if I pull algae's, I'm thinking, oh, I've got choices to make. I need to look at this. Which way... Am I going? And for me, which is always happens, is like, which way does Mother Earth want me to go? It might not be the same way that I think I want to go. Um, in fact, quite often it isn't. Mel's <laughs> just shaking her head too. We know this. Um, I'm used to it. I've been doing it all my life. So I think, okay, which way do you want me to go now? I'm at a crossroads. Actually, I was very comfortable walking along the straight path and not having any turnings, but I'm not supposed to be comfortable. I'm supposed to change. I'm supposed to do something different. I'm supposed to grow. And I don't know which way. So I have to sit there at that crossroads and see what, for me, what otherworldly creature or this worldly creature comes. And I will see something, maybe a new robin, you know, maybe I see a, a little bee in the grass or something, and it's sort of going left ways. So I go, do you mean I should go left? And something will happen to either say yes or no. And if it says yes, then it's okay, let's try that. So this always brings up choices, different ways, different ways that the deer trods are going. And I think it's really important for us now because we're at a, we've got to make a choice. Mm. You know, climate change is saying, you ain't got no more time. You can't have any more committees. Stop talking and do. Mm. And we actually have to get there and choose. And I think both Melda and I are there. We can, you know, we're trying to do things that will help people to choose, to help people be here at Argus. And to make the choice that is appropriate. I don't like the words right and wrong, it's good and bad. Let's do the appropriate choice. But that's where I am. Okay, I'll take all these down. I think people have seen it. But yeah, I'm completely with you there. And also, you know, making choices, also making the cho choice that is right, that honors the ancient ones, that honors nature, that honors all those beings we're in relationship with, because that's the thing we do not learn in our culture. Yeah. So I'm completely with you there. And for me, Rune Aldis is, I mean, it has many meanings. I mean, as well as like forks in the road where you make a decision. I sort of primarily see it as well like the crow's foot. And also yeah. as antlers, it's very much for me in my work. But as I could say, you know, you can only work with the runes through personal interpretation. So mm -hmm. I can't really tell anyone what the runes definitely mean. I can only tell people what most rune magicians agree on. And I can tell you what I have found through years of working intimately with the runes. But like beyond that, it's over to you. So for me, it's very much um, antlers. So it's for me about all antler beings. And at my house in Sweden, I'm talking to you from London today, but my preferred location is our house in Sweden, where I have a school and teach people, house students. 
And um, at that house, we see the deer like all the time. You only need to look out of the kitchen window. You see them in really big numbers. We see um, elks as well, or American people would say moose. And these are all antlered creatures. And for me, um, they very much pose the question about like, what is my wild self? Where if I proud them not to be wild? And like, I'm 54 now, I need to be getting on with this. Like, where in my life do I need to change the programming? to actually step closer to that wilder self and that wilder self that really honors the wild ones you know, and the ancient ones and all of their manifestations. And that's also the wild self, for instance, that cannot live in fear of death. I must accept that. You know, death is definitely what's going to happen to me. So it's usually important the choices I make before I make that transition. So it's also about not living in denial. So yeah. and there are many like other meanings as well. Maybe another time, I'd love to talk to you again, Ellen, and we could talk about that axis between room uh, thurs and thurisas and room algies, because I think that's such rich territory. And we caught on the subject briefly before we started the recording, but let's just leave that as a treat for another day, if that's okay with you. I think so. I think that would be wonderful. So, but then about, you know, wilding, a thing that really struck me about your work and also reading your book about deer trolls, I desperately want to talk about the deer trolls, um, is that you grew up in a family where from your mother, your father, your grandmother, um, not only was it like your birthright and you were instructed in these ways, but also, and this is a very rare thing, you were given words, you know, the word for, like, say, we use the tongue the word shaman, but, you know, you had access to old British words for that. Would you, like, would you like to tell us a bit more about that? Because so many people I teach, and so many people, even the ones who write books, they more come to support, so called it tongues, shamanism in older age. And then they sort of, you know, they have to learn those words to even describe their experience. But I think you yeah. had the good fortune of being given those words in childhood. Is that right? I did. Um, I was thinking this morning, so I was thinking about us talking today mm -hmm. and looking forward to it. And for some reason, the first cat in my life, I, I'm a, sorry, I'm a cat freak, total cat woman. I am the old cat woman. And... Um, the first cat who came to live in my life when I was about one and a half. And yes, I can remember right back to then. And actually we all could if we were allowed to realize that we could. But anyway, the first cat came and dad brought him home and he was a little wee black kitten with long fur. And dad was sort of like, here we are now. He's just come to live with us. And has he told you his name yet? And so I said, you know how children are, absolutely certain. And I said, yes, he's called Tweeny Puss because he comes from in between. Mm. And I couldn't, I don't know what I was really thinking then because I was so young, but I can remember doing it. And dad told me about it afterwards again and said, yes, you got it right. You did remember that. The words came because he, he never made me disconnect. When I saw beings and fairies and things down in the garden, I said, what did they say? And well, did you do that? You didn't disturb them, did you? So it was all like real. Um, he did try and tell me before I went to school, you know, baby school at five. And he sort of said, don't talk about all this when you go to school. Of course, I didn't listen. Um, and so that began my learning, rather roughly, of how to keep my head down. Mm -hmm. And this is what I got. I mean, you know, grandma was a witch and that sort of thing, so was mum. But she died when I was very young, so I didn't know that. Um, my uncle, one of my uncles, he was what we call a woodsman. Now it's not a gamekeeper, it's someone who looks after the woods. Mm. And when I was a, a kid, he'd just say, come on, let's go out in the woods, let's go out to the, let's go out to the forest, let's go and have a walk. And he could put his arm up, and you can see this, he could put his arm up like that and it'd be right up there. And it'd be his fist like that. And he'd just stand there in the field. And within a couple of minutes, 
a wild hawk would be on his fist. Wow. And I, I grew up with this, so I thought everybody can do that. Um, <laughs> you go to school, you start talking about it, and you get, nah, hey, hey, hey. Um, <laughs> so you say, oh, right, no, people can't do that. So that was it. We have um, adders in this country. There's the poisonous snake. They're very beautiful. And he would sit, uncle would sit there with an, an adder on his wrist. And they were just sun together. They're not, they, they're unlikely to kill you unless you're very old, very ill or very young. Um, you will feel a bit sick if they bite you, but they're not going to bite you unless you upset them. You tread on one. I mean, I, I'd feel fairly cross if somebody trod on me. Um, they do too. So I grew up with all of this and the words that came were natural. The woman who lived next door was, she was officially the village midwife and she had been trained in midwifery, but she was the village healer and she was also the midwife to death. Mm -hmm. And this is back in the 1950s, which, you know, there was the 1950s, seriously guys, there was a universe then. Um, and she, we children of the old ones, for want of a better term, we would be asked to help her. So I got to help clean and look after dead human bodies when I was eight. Wow. And the difference that makes, and I remember the first one, she was, um, she was granny over the bakery, because we had a bakery in the village at that time. And she was granny over the bakery, who I always loved. We all liked her because you'd go around there and she'd give you um, cake and she, she was also a herbalist. And so she would teach you about herbs and things because she said, what's this granny? That's a blah, blah, blah. And um, she died. And my stepmom, who was also a witch, um, so it said, oh, Mrs. Weber needs you and, and you and Colleen can go in and help because Granny's dead. Oh, Granny's dead. And she, yes, Granny's dead. We've got to help her pass over. So this was normal. And it's not normal to you nowadays. Nobody helps, you know, you pay hundreds of thousands of pounds to some professional to mummify your poor wretched parent. Um, much less now. That's getting better in this country. But you didn't actually see them when they were just dead. And they hadn't been clean, you know, hadn't been cleaned up or prepared or made to look pretty or anything. Mm -hmm. And it's actually okay. Because they look real. But the one thing I did get, and one thing I think is really important, and I wish more people would get it, at least you could try and get it by being with your pet, you know, your 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 own animal who lives with you when they die is the difference in the look when somebody is alive mm. and when they're dead. And you absolutely know in your bones that the spirit has gone. The flesh is there. And if it's only like within an hour, they don't look very different. They look asleep. Um, but after that, it starts to change. But mm. In that first hour, you can see and they look asleep, but you know the spirit has gone. And it's all those sort of things that we don't get. And I do wish we would. I mean, we do get it. Some people do do it. I know people who, you know, oh, you know, the dog has, the dog has died. We're going to look after the dog and take the dog into the next world. So mm -hmm. that's and they take them through, and it's nice. But you're not even supposed to allow children to see Granda when they're dead. Yeah, that's a way of thinking now that I don't agree with you at all, because you really rob children of formative experiences. Because, mm -hmm. you know, how do you think? Because I think that's so beautiful what you just described. And, you know, one of my big um, themes is um, the rites of passage work with children. Mm -hmm you know, helping children move through experiences of initiation. So I'd very much like to hear, okay, could you see how the experience you had, how how could we bring that into our culture today? Do you have any ideas about that? Um, <laughs> well, you, you have just pressed a nice button there, because <laughs> my first answer is get rid of the government. 
Um, <laughs> but um, we need, it, it's back to this attitude change again. As you said earlier, and absolutely agree with you. Yes, it's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. If I'm, you know, what is the one certain thing in your life? You're going to die. Mm -hmm. um, you can't push it away. It won't go away. It won't hide. Um, so we need to change that, that death is okay. And I said my mum died when I was uh, three and a half um cervical cancer nobody knew how to deal with it in those days and um she died now in those days they would bring the coffin back and put it on the dining room table and all the friends would come and pay their respects yeah. in your house and mum hadn't been mummified or whatever it is they do with them nowadays she was just mum dead and that was it i was allowed to go in fact, I was encouraged to go. Do you want to go and, in fact, if dad was like, do you want to go and sit with mum for a few hours, mm. help her get across? I was only three, but I got it in my own way. Yeah. And my aunts were a little bit weird. Mum's sisters were, I don't, know, I don't know how she got into that family, but anyway, she did. And <laughs> she, they sort of said, oh, you can't take the child to the, to the funeral. Joe oh, yeah, yeah. and dad said oh yes you, yes I can and so I went and I remember saying we um they they buried her lowered her into the grave and I was holding dad's hand and I said mum isn't in isn't in the box is she dad and he went no no she's gone away she's better now because I'd seen her in the hospital ill yeah. she's better now and do you know what happened when my dad died? It was absolutely amazing. Um, I've got, uh, I had three brothers and two, one of the brothers, um, two of his children were on the spectrum. And one of them had chosen not to come, absolutely fine. And the other one had chosen to come, the first boys. And James had come. And we went to the funeral, it was great. It was a very good funeral. And um, we had the wake back at our house, mum's house, which was lovely again. We weren't, you know, everybody was there making tea and everybody mm -hmm. brought sandwiches and everything like that. And so I went off to make some more tea in the kitchen and James followed me. And it was, Auntie Ellen? Yes, James? Granddad wasn't in the box, was he? <laughs> and I just went, oh. Oh, and you know Peter, my brother, hadn't sort of told him not to do this, and they were they. I mean, they were on the kids were on the spectrum anyway, but Janet and Peter had learned how to be with them as well, and it was just like, yeah, we need yeah. this. Yeah, we need to actually know. Uh, it's like, yes, you can. You know, yes, I've met my mum since she's dead, and we've talked. Um, and lots of other people as well. And one of the things I do is um, help the people who are dead to actually know they're dead and go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and psychopomp is the posh word for it. Um, but we don't do that. And we need these transitions. And I don't know whether we could actually... I mean, some people do, they do do rites of passage, but it needs to be much better known. And you need to be able to sort of say, well, you can go and ask an elder, or go and ask Ellen, and they'll help you through with this, with, you know, with dad passing or whatever it is. And to learn that you don't need to be afraid. And somebody sort of says to me, saying, are you afraid of death? I said, no, but I just hope it doesn't hurt this time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think we could all say that. And um, because of this time is the other thing, isn't it, Imelda? Yeah. I know. I've been here before. You've been here before. We know this. Yeah, we know that we have been. And we also know that, you know, well, I even feel we're here with quite a large number of people who have been here before who are being offered the opportunity to make different choices. Now, are we making those different choices? Are we? I don't know. That's the thing. Um, I think more people are. Um, 
and I think more people are learning that you can't be a selfish isolationist. Um, I don't think any animal is, and certainly all plants aren't. All plants are community and family. Yeah. Um, that latest book. Have you read the late, that book on you know, the hidden life of trees? It's absolutely stunning. It's oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I did read that. Yeah. Beautiful book. And but it's beautiful. written by this German woodsman. Yes, that's right. The plants of trees. Yeah. And it's what he's seen and how trees will actually help feed one that's sick and one that's been chopped down, they will all help it to, if it's supposed to grow again. Not always, but if it's supposed to grow if again. it's possible. And they share yeah. nutrition. It's sort of like a really like a community. So if a plant is low on water or nutrition, they'll send it down the root system. And, you know, like maybe even fun, fungi like have the help of that as well. You know, I also love this idea that, you know, that the fungi or the fungi um, you know, in an earlier time, you heard us talk about in ancient times, but that trees today have root systems because there was this partnership with the fungi and that, they, you know, like they made an agreement for the fungi to become the sort of root system of trees in some way or form. So they have the mycelium, but also they have pulled other beings how to grow roots and networks on the ground. And that's what I think of as the real internet when I work, where, sorry, when I work in the forest in Sweden, I always feel that you know, why do I spend time on the computer? This is the real internet, you know, right. You, you well, learn the les lessons of connection. I do, and, and, and I love to be out there too, but I do get um, what we call a kick in the pants here from other worlds, sort of saying, yeah, you, you've had your treat, now get back and start working because I'm Yeah, that's the this. thing, that is the thing, you know. And oh. you apparently can say it, so you get out there and you get back on your computer and you can go out again in a couple of hours when you've done some more work. Wow. <laughs> and it's <sort> of like, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> <laughs> But I think we all get that. In, in this slide, I mean, my students start saying it fairly quickly. You know, I wanted to do this, but Otherworld really insisted that I had to do that. Yeah. And then I went and did it, and it was actually great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's also about finding the balance because, you know, I'm happiest in Sweden. Uh, you know, like it's just, uh, you know, the pure air, the, you know, you have the sun and the moon for neighbors. You have um, a night sky without light pollution. So like you have all that, you know, you can see the stars you can't see in London. And I love all of that. But inevitably, I have to return to London. There's parenting to be done, teaching to be done, uh, writing to be done. Yeah. And you know, really have to accept that that's part of my life too. So my life is bigger chunks, a chunk as the summer in Sweden, and then it's sort of, you know, eight weeks in London. So like it divides up in a different way, not always in the same day, but it certainly divides up. And there's always a very good reason for me to return to London. So talking to you from London. And I also just wanted to pick up on what you said about, uh, you know, that the trees and how trees and plants and these whole communities, you know, how they are in relationship with each other. Because again, before we went on the recording, we were talking a bit about linguistics and, and languages. And one language I'm learning at the moment is Finnish. Mm. And in Finnish, the word for a sibling is kasvi, which is very closely related to the word for plant. So actually, even in Finnish, it's a non-gendered language. It's a very interesting language. So that's quite good for like, you know, uh, you know, for seeing around us today, for people to look closer at languages like Finnish, which operate in a different way. But the point I was going to make is that if you read Finnish in translation, it's just going to get translated into, you know, this is my sibling, this is my brother, or this is my sister. And, you know, yeah, in English, that's what you arrive at. But if you actually look at the Finnish, it's what the word means, and it's close connection to the plant um, kingdom, as it were, yeah. then a brother or a sister means something along the lines of, um, this is like we're both plants in a garden tended by our parents and we've grown up together in the sense of in the way plants grow, something needs support. So we have grown up by supporting each other and that's how we've grown and evolved. So if you really look at the etymology of what that word really means, that's what word brother or sister means in Finnish. And then to just say, oh, well, we'll translate that as brother or sister. For me, there is an entire world of meaning that disappears through the translation, which is, and we talked about this, I'm obsessed 
you know, where at all possible, and I don't speak all languages, unfortunately, but where possible, you know, reading material in the original and not in translation, because it's all of those layers of meaning that just drop off. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. You were asking about the deer trots. Yeah, we have to talk about deer trots, please. Well, you've just sort of led right into it, because um, people have actually known about these things. If you, right, get into a different way. If you head off down to the garden center and you buy a plant, you may well see on the shelves as you go past a thing called root grow. And you may feel that, you know, Gardener's World has encouraged you to buy that and put that in the soil with your plant. Very good idea, actually. Root grow are the spores of the various fungi who make up the the team of mycorrhiza. And they're the ones who, and most fungi do it, do this in different ways. They're the ones who have the relationship with the soil and with the plants. And once upon a time, before we started cutting forests down and plowing mm -hmm. earth, the whole of the land surface of earth was covered in these fungi and they enabled the trees to grow. They still grow, they still go for ages and the scientists have put a um, little radioactive thing in the fungi and they've tracked it and it's gone over 40 miles. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they've also found um, by watching and studying that um, I think it was with some birch trees, this experiment, but one birch tree was really sort of like, I'm not going to make it through the winter. And, but there were other birch trees around. And they were fat and full and happy. And the mycorrhiza took food from the well-fed trees and gave it to the sick tree. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of these trees were connected through the mycorrhiza. And they all know each other. And they were exactly what you said in Finnish. They were siblings. Now, we talk about following the deer trods, and these mm -hmm. are the old pathways of the deer, mm -hmm. which they still run in Finland and... Um, in Sweden, and, oh yes. And, and, well, I think in Sweden as well, in Finland as well, but I don't know. Anyway, they still run in various places, what used to be called the boreal forest. And actually the whole of Britain was once in the boreal forest, right down to the tip of Cornwall. Not anymore, but we were. And so all of this was the physical side of the deer trods is these fungi. The deer follows them and the deer follow the paths and we follow the paths that the deer follow. Mm -hmm. we follow the deer and grandmother deer leads us all up the hill for the summer and then down to the forest for the winter, which is simplistic, but they do. And we learn not just how to follow the deer in the physical, but we learn from the deer by following them, by watching what they did as they passed this place or went up mm. that place or stopped before they went into this place. And all of that has taught us how to work with Mother Earth, because of course they work with Mother Earth all the time. It's normal. Can't, work, can't live without it. And we learned that. And for me, the mycorrhiza are the threads which connect everything to everything in the deer troughs, where I'm connected to you, I'm connected to the audience, I'm connected to my cat, uh, my garden, and all this sort of thing. In the same sort of sibling way that the mycorrhiza enable for the plants. And we need to get that idea back in our heads that we're not separate. We are connected. We are part of the same family. Mm -hmm. And actually, I mean, I suspect you teach this in your own way too, but that when you're healing, those are the threads that you're actually using and working with and asking, should I go down that way? Back to Alice again. Yeah. Should I go down that way? Should I go down that way? Should I be helping this person's liver? Um, no, get out. We're doing that. Fine, fine. Sorry. Um, where should I go? 
and this sort of thing. And we're following these, at the moment, perhaps invisible threads, although people do get to see them. Um, and we're following those. And that's what we're doing when we follow the deer trunks. And that's what I teach is how to mm. discover these threads, which actually means discovering you. Yeah. yeah. Discovering yourself and changing your attitudes to everything. Yeah. Um, because you won't discover yourself while you still think you're God's gift of creation. And um, which all of us have a tendency to, and I'm not denying it for me. Um, but that's what the deer trods are, and they are in the earth. I find them very much in rivers. Rivers sing for me, streams sing for me. And so there is algae's again, that the river's coming down, now it's diverting off here, now it's joining up with this river. And where are you going? And you can feel that thread. And that's what the deer trods are. This knowing yeah. of the threads. But also the fit. And, yeah, and the deer trots remain in the landscape, even in places where we can't see them anymore. Because like in Sweden, you know, you can see them and they're very, very clear. And I spent yeah. a lot of time walking the deer trots because, you know, our house is situated in the forest, but the forest around it, um, what's the word? It's um, it's wild in the sense of there are no other paths, I mean, only deer trots, but there are no regular yeah. paths, there are no signs telling you where the exit is or how you get on. So yeah. I also have to give my students a lot of warnings around like the animals that live in the forest and that you really can get lost really, really quickly. You can be lost kind of like really 20 yards from the forest edge. If the forest is dense, you could be that close to the way out. I'm horribly if, envious. <laughs> you, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't know it. You'd consider yourself lost if you don't know in which direction to walk. Yeah. And... Uh, but also walking on these deer trots, what always strikes me is it follows a completely non-human intelligence. So, you know, and also it's sometimes the deer trots that you use to load, they become a little bit wider. Most of them, I'm talking about my behind my house in Sweden, are quite small. So like one human being can go through it at a time. And some their whole herd skeleton, so they become a bit bigger. But by all means and purposes, if you were to be lost in a forest behind her house and you would see a deer troll, then you would think, yay, you know, you would think it's human made, I'm going to be walking that, I'm going to be led out of the forest. Well, actually, no, <laughs> you're going to be led deeper and deeper into the forest and you'll have all sorts of initiatory experiences. So that's just uh, kind of like, a, and then also they're really great for the mushrooms as well, because I lost, I, I love studying mushrooms. Um, hang on, is the are we, I think, is the quality cutting out? Hang on, let's see. Um, no, connected and secure. Can you hear me, Ellen? Oh, you froze. I up. can, yeah, yeah, I can. Okay. Yeah, you're back. One of us froze. Oh, One of us froze. Just so, checking that we're still here. I'm still here. Can you see okay. me? Yeah, yeah, everything's fine. It was just a little okay. bit. Yeah, okay. of okay. that will happen on Zoom. But... The deer trots are really great also for finding the mushrooms. That's why I wanted to pick up on what you said there. So when I go on my journey looking for mushrooms, is when you follow the deer trolls, that's where you can find really amazing mushrooms. So there's that relationship between deer and mushrooms. Oh, I think, hang on. Hello. Yeah, hello, coming. Yeah. It's on the internet. That was my end it cut out. I think I'm back on. Can you see you me? Are definitely back on. I can see you. We're seeing <laughs> each other. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. okay. You're reminding me of something then, Imelda. Um, there's a, a bloke, um, one of the lords in Ireland, who is actually um, the grandson or great grandson of one of the fairy story people. Um, he has rewilded huge acres thousands of acres of his land recently over the past seven years mm. and i was hearing something from him um the other day he makes well, he doesn't make he gets all his staff and any visitors who come and you only get you only go there by appointment and they don't walk their own man-made paths they damn it they all walk where the deer walk oh wow yeah i know i know Wonderful. it's absolutely like yay this guy's got it. And 
we were talking, you know, with rewilding, it's it's that kind of change of and he says he was a player, as they say. And he's what, 30 something, I suppose now. And um, you know, he he was citified and a player and a girl on each arm and one in front and one behind kind of thing and down the clubs and all this sort of thing. And then something clicked in him, which I haven't discovered what it is, but anyway, something clicked. And he came back when his dad died and said, looked at everything and said, we're doing this wrong. We need to learn to share. And that his whole thing is about, we've got to bring ourselves back into nature and we've got to allow nature back into us. Yeah. yeah. And then he said, I said about walking, actually walking the deer trods around. His wow. Yeah. And it was like, whoa. <laughs> I like this guy. <laughs> yeah, you would like him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. But like talking about the wild and about deer tots, you know, in the old gear video, we just showed part of uh, the wolves were very present uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. I just wondered if we should talk about that as well, like the relationship between the deer and the wolves, because I think that's not always immediately apparent to people who want to see beautiful deer. Well, frankly, I think wolves are beautiful too. Oh, they, um, are. they but, are. Um talking about the sort of popular perception yeah, of one I and know, of being know, beautiful and the other carrying the shadow of being seen as a sort of dangerous. And they, they are so not. I mean, um about forty-five thousand years ago in the what is called the Chauvet Caves in southern France, um there was a wolf and a child of about four foot, four and a half foot, four foot high, I think it was, so say 10. Um, and they are walking beside each other. Wow. And the footprints are in the cave. Yeah, yeah. And my friend, uh, Sean Ellis, who um, teaches wolves, gives you wolves to experience, he says, and I agree with him, and I think other people are saying it too, wolves, taught us about family mm. because wolves live in family and it always feels to me uh, i was writing a short story about it one day that the wolves watched us grow and they saw they look possible we could go and try and teach them and so they came to our fires wow. and we learned this is how you behave when you're the decision maker, this is how you behave when um, you're the enforcer in the pack, which is, we're not doing that, we don't do that. But the decision maker says, well, I think we need to go this way back to Algier again. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the, the ones who are social and look after the puppies mm -hmm. and teach the puppies that, you know, no, you can't keep biting everybody's tail. And um, they are, when you watch them, they are so family. But what happened, as I'm sure many people know in Yellowstone, is when they took the wolves out, they killed them, which was quite horrible. That's horrible. Um, it, and the pictures are, yeah. um, don't go there. Um, but when they took the deer out, the wolves out rather, the deer ate all the forest. Yes. And they stopped everything. I mean, Monbiot's lovely little video, um, how, how Wolves Change Rivers, is brilliant. They changed the life of everything in the forest because the apex predator, or one of the apex predators, was not there. Yeah. And we need to understand that deer, when they're, I mean, we have this in Scotland, and you say you have it in, in Sweden as well. Um, Deer, when they're not being kept under control as far as their population goes, which is what wolves do, if they're eating them, then they eat everything else and they wreck the landscape. I mean, Scotland is, is a devastated landscape because it has too many deer. Yeah. Um, they're big deer too. I mean, they're the red deer. Mm. And they've got the roe and the fallow as well. But the red deer, it's, they're huge beasts and they're everywhere. There is the, they're reforesting Scotland 
gradually, gently, and they're doing a good job. But there were no trees because not just the sheep, but the deer ate the forests. And there was no balance. There was no exchange. Yeah, yeah. And if you're frightened of wolves, you just don't know anything about wolves because the wolves know you're there within a mile, long before you'll yeah. ever hear or see them. They can hear, see, and smell you. And they're not going to go near this horrible, dangerous creature, the human. As far as they're concerned, we're a sort of like, whoa, dodgy species. <laughs> yes. They kill us. Let's keep away. And so they're not going to, there's no such thing as a ravening wolf. That's a, God knows where that myth came from. But anyway, there isn't one. They don't hunt you. No, they, they will don't. attack you. They, if you upset one, you yeah. corner one, um, it's going to fight for its life. But then aren't you, if you get mm -hmm. cornered? You know, you're going to come out fighting. And unless you harm them, nothing will hurt you. Nothing at all, except possibly another human, because they seem to like doing it. But wolves are fine, and they're necessary. So are lynx. Yes, yeah. All exactly. the predators are. Um, strictly speaking, so are bears. But what's the problem with bears in America? Because all these ditzy trippers went up and said, oh, pretty bear, look, it's my teddy bear. Let's give it some food. Yeah. yeah. So they look at you as Sainsbury's. Yeah. Here, come, here comes the food wagon, guys. Come on, let's get on it. And we can eat them too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you, this is the attitude thing. You've got to get back into wild is good. Well, it's good. And, you know, it's it's about right relationship. It's back to that idea. Because yeah. in, in Sweden, then, where our house is, you know, we have an overkill of deer. And as I said, I love it. My students love it. It's like teaching you around to the Safari Park. There's you know, just like so much wildlife. And uh, like many wild boar as well and their babies like yeah. running. So that's really lovely as well. And there are two wolf packs in the area, but they're a little distance away. They will sometimes come into our area and we'll sometimes see glimpses of them. But mostly they're slightly to the west of us. And actually I'll be talking to the farmers and the local people. And they're all sort of saying that it didn't actually because you know the deer have lost their predator. Or like there are wolves, but at the moment in our area there are not enough wolves. Uh, to deal with all the deer. So the deer uh, population has exploded. And that's actually putting pressure, like, you know, like you're putting pressure on everything. Even when there's been logging and they plant a new forest, they'll go and like, you know, eat the saplings. Uh, they do damage to the crops of the local farmers. So, you know, the local farmers perceive them as a menace. But the whole thing is that there's something that's out of balance there. And then actually, because we also think as, you know, predators as like really terrible things, but even the predators in the animal kingdom actually have their place and they have their function. Like for, you know, the ecology of the whole thing to function, you need both. And then we have like lynxes as well. They're like, that's another, you know, more predatorial animal we have in the forest. Yeah. So we have lynxes, we have those wild cats, but still uh, not enough of the wolves and the lynxes to deal with the deer population. No, no, no. This is a problem. I and mean, I actually, I, I'm, I'm a meat eater. Um, I eat vegetables too, but I eat meat, but I get most of my meat from um, some people I know in Scotland, and a lot of it is wild. Mm. And they have, as I said, a deer problem in Scotland. Now, these people are in Aberdeenshire, so it's less the red deer, it's what they get, and they get them all over the place, like as you do, is the little roe deer. Yeah. And so, um, this um, butcher friend um, company, which is very good, they've made an agreement to, with the farmers on the land and say, we will um, get the, the roe deer culled so they shoot them at the right time and they've got good guys who can just go bang and that's it. Um, and then they take them and they parcel them up and the local people get some. But any that's excess, they sell. Mm. And I'm one of the buyers. Yeah, and wow. I am, in that sense, I'm doing 
my predator role to help keep the whole ecosystem going better. And I thank you for owning that and thank you for saying that a lot. Because it has, you know, that's why I just said predators have, have their place in the entire cycle. So the sort of notion that if you eliminate all predators that are going to be living in, well, essentially a Disneyland world where you have to talk to the animals. Well, you know, you made, or one of your students made a reference to that. But, you know, that is just not the model to follow. That doesn't work. No, no it doesn't. And we would be, and most of my friends up there would be much happier if the wolves did a hell of a lot of the job as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, not that, I mean, I, I like venison and I find it's a very good meat because it's, you know, the animals are natural. Yeah. They haven't been stuffed full of corn and they haven't been kept mm -hmm. in barns and all that kind of horrible thing. Um, <laughs> so it, it does my body a lot more good. Um, but there would still be enough for me and for the others of us who buy. But we do need the wolves to help keep the deer in their proper balance. It's a little bit like I said, there's a, there's a role of the wolf, which um, they call the enforcer. Uh, there's a test, I'm learning this from Sean. Um, there's a tester as well, who just says, are you up for this? Are you any good at this? Or are you gonna make a mess of it? And if you absolutely refuse to learn, he calls in the enforcer. Yeah. Now, this is where, I mean, when you see wolves, um, and if you go on Sean's Facebook page, it's lovely. When they're sort of having an argument, they grab each other's jaw. And the one who's sort of like saying, whoa, cool it guy, is like, mm. and they're not, they, they won't, you find, won't find blood. And, like, arr, 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 arr. and then it sort of calms down. But if one of them doesn't, then the enforcer will come in and you'll put the, the wolf who won't shut up on his back, maybe there, but, you know, with his teeth around his throat. And that wolf goes, I think I overstepped the mark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's actually quite okay to tell someone when they've overstepped the mark. All animals do it, probably plants do it, but I haven't worked that one out yet. <laughs> and um, this is what will happen. They will, they will learn, if we learn from wolves again, we will learn that, you know, this is okay, this is exchange, this is balance, and yet I'm allowed to have a bit of a tantrum. If I start getting completely crazy, somebody's going to go, you know, whoa, stop. And you, you do come back. And the wolf comes back. And I got that wrong, didn't I? You know, sort of feeling yeah wow so that's the thing isn't it that wolves are actually really good teachers for us and to come back to where we started at the beginning that like we are the youngest species on the planet so all the other species are older meaning they've had more time to learn and work out the ways that work and so they don't seem to be burdened with the egos that the human being possess and abolish which is another huge difference so there's like so much we can learn when we come back to those like animal plants mushroom etc teachers or even the elements themselves absolutely with the elements themselves yeah and i find that we've got to do that if we want to continue living on planet earth and existing on planet earth We've got to do that. Yeah. There isn't any other way. And no technology won't fix it for you. No, technology won't fix it. And as I said, any kind of Disney-fied or romantic or whatever ideas will not fix it either. We've got to actually... Because, you know, we live in a culture where so much is hidden from few. You talked about how we don't see dead bodies anymore, but yeah. or only after they've been processed and embalmed. Well, actually, it's a sacred act of service to lay out the body. And, you know, it's a privilege to be with a person who's recently died and hold space for them and really? make their sensation. So that's just like one example you gave. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, like, like we buy meat in the supermarket, we don't see who's butchered. We have like weird ideas about wolves. I mean, I think for us to rewild ourselves, we also have got to have those experience again, like not shy, or like say again, at our house in Sweden, especially this time of year, September is like hunting season in Sweden. So like by the end of August, the first hunters start appearing, conscious going off and stuff. 
And you know, one of them I don't like is very much. But through conversations with hunters, I've also learned a lot. It's like, you know, you really learn a lot about the realities of life. And you learn about why these hunters come into the area. But one of the reasons is there's not enough food. So with all of these less pretty things, I think for human beings to rewild themselves, we got to step beyond the meat and the cling film in the supermarket or your loved one dies and you only see them embalmed and laid out by the funerary home in their past. Yeah. Actually, they're really big experiences of true human learning and you know, the rights of passage experiences actually lie in being present for these moments of transition where something really big occurs and dealing with the, the blood and the core and the discomfort of that. Yes. Like not, not leading a sanitized life. No, a sanitized life doesn't get you anywhere no. at all. I mean, I've been very pleased um, uh, through my lifetime. Um, men are encouraged to go and be there at the birth of their children. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, And I am so encouraged by that. Um, occasionally, I gather from a nurse friend that they still have to be steered out because they suddenly get nauseous. And we haven't got time for you. Go and be sick outside, <laughs> um, which is very good for them as well. Because, you know, you, you, you're not being treated as the, the thing. You're a nuisance. Go away. Yeah. Um, but they are getting so much better. Um, they understand about caring for babies a bit oh you see men doing wonderful parenting now i think that's so wonderful you see these fathers yeah. really being present and you know yeah. i mean that's a wonderful wonderful thing and i'm yeah. so happy that that's becoming more of the norm or what we aspire to that so, so imagine, okay. it always must have been yeah um because um in 1966 there was a conference in chicago um, academics and anthropologists and all sorts of things. It was, it was called Man the Hunter, which was a little bit of a on the part of the people there, because um, it was actually disproving the myth. Uh -huh. And I, I've got the papers and there's a paper book about this size, and it's very interesting if you can tolerate reading academe. Um, but they found that you know, it wasn't man goes out and hunts, woman sits at home and cooks. No, no. Very often, the women were much better trackers. Yeah. And this is when we still had um, people who lived wild like that around the world. Um, back in 1966, we have very few left now. But, and they were better hunters at some things. And that sometimes men were better foragers than the women. But it didn't actually become a gender thing at all. It became like, Fred is really good at finding mushrooms. Jane is really good at killing deer. Therefore, that is what they do. And um, I, I know another bloke, bloke called Will Lord, who um, is one of the best Stone Age teachers in in. They say the world certainly in britain um and he was taught by his father who was one as well and he one of the things he specializes in is flint napping and fiona went to a course with his father years and years and years ago and um i think there's three or four of them there and will said uh, john that's will's father said at the beginning he said women are usually better flint nappers than men that Women quite often end up with a few arrowheads or axe heads. Men have a tendency to work up when end up with a pile of rubble at their feet. <laughs> now that goes right against all the sort of modern gender ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it, it, our ancestors, our pale, well, I love the Paleolithic, our Paleolithic ancestors, and some of the Mesolithic as well. Um, they did things because so and so was good at it. Yeah. And if you happen to be good at really looking after the kids, okay, that's what you did. If you happen to be good at making fish baskets, that's what you did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it didn't matter what gender you were at all. Yeah. And we've got to get back into that. Go back to that. And again, I mentioned very how Finnish is this non gendered language where human beings are, you know, in some ways, it's about to come. But, you know, like that to me also indicates how, how ancient that language is. There's such ancient knowledge. 
and also like Finland is really people in Finland are known for living very close to the land you know like Sweden they really have the wild mm-hmm. and you know that sort of whole concept that sort of intimacy with the wild is deeply wired into their language mm-hmm. so yes yeah. and we fun. definitely need to get back to that yeah and some of it as you say and uh, Right, we're writers, so okay, you know, we're probably word freaks. Um, yes. <laughs> um, you do, when you start looking at words, they're fascinating and they teach you so much about your own history. Yeah, they really do. Mm-hmm. They really do. And then you have the, you know, if you're a bit of a linguist, you know, where when I'm writing and I can st- get stuck on a word or if I'm researching something and I'm not entirely satisfied with what I get, I just start thinking, okay, which other languages do I speak and can I do research in or use? And, you know, some of the miracle occurs when you're on something in another language. So if you get stuck in Swedish, try Finnish. If you get stuck in Finnish, try Russian. Uh, if that doesn't work, try Lithuanian. Well, that was for help <laughs> by the time, but then you know, I don't actually speak Lithuanian. You know, or sometimes even like, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes even in understanding the runes, like it's been something that men in Chinese or even not the characters they use today, but the kanji they had much earlier, that like really clarifies it. And you can see a relationship between the early kanji, the earlier characters used in Chinese yeah. and like the runes. Or you go to other early alphabets, like the Phoenician alphabet or the Egyptian hieroglyphs. And you can go down all sorts of rabbit holes, but ultimately I find when you do that, you're going to hit gold and you're going to find that sort of thing. And then you realize, oh, that was like lost in our language. And also what's lost from language sort of drops out of cultural awareness. But then being writers and researchers, you know, and I really admire and support all the people who are doing that work, and there's quite a lot of them at the moment, yeah, there are. who are like sort of, you know, sort of bringing all these cold nuggets back, you know, retrieving them, and they're sort of planting them back into our culture. And I think that, for me, is one of the jobs of a writer, or at least the kind of writer I aspire to be, and the kind of writer I think you are as well. Well, yes, I mean, I, I do it differently, and uh, I get stuck in novels. Um, how can I say this? So that it works. Um, and not being a linguist like you, um, I tend to use the lesser spotted, the lesser spotted thesaurus quite often. Because you get the similars of the word and they spark other ideas at you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, that's what I mean. I don't want this word. That's better. Then you chase that word down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you come to this is actually expressing what this character is going to say or do at that particular moment so I find that but I, you've just made me think um not very long ago probably last year and a woman archaeologist anthropologist and she started collecting written language and she's gone back 50 100,000 years by trying to see and seeing patterns in markings in caves mm-hmm. and um, a friend of mine put me onto the book a while back and I just read it and it's like wow and she she is sort of seeing these patterns and when you're talking about is the this rooms, what's her name Genevieve or what's her yeah, name yeah Genevieve yeah no. yeah I can't remember her other name and I can't remember the name of her book um, but it's absolutely fascinating what she's done. And she also gets the spirit side of it as well. Mm. She, when, she, when she's writing about it, she's saying, yes, I'm actually seeing like um, um, a fire ceremony in this cave yeah. when I go and sit there. But I was thinking with the runes and for me with the ogham, with the ohm, um, which is, you know, a, a central line and then you put lines on it. And so many of the things that she's seen and the patterns there they are they correspond yeah i think that's fascinating because i was researching her work for a book i'm writing about moons right now so i was trying to go back all the, all the way to like the paleolithic times the first markings in cave some of them look, look, look remarkably like moons then you end up okay. looking at the work of maria kimbutas as well you know the Lithuanian 
anthropologist, etc., etc. So I'm on all sorts of adventures for this at the moment. And, yeah. and Genevieve's work came up. It's stupid, I can't remember her surname. I can look it up and put it in. It's just gone now. completely, and I can't remember the book name I either. I see but... her in front of me, but what she essentially does, she looks like she makes a record of all of these markings in caves, and then she tries to write, you could almost call it an alphabet, except not an alphabet, but like, what are the sort of components? So she makes these, uh, what's the word, like, lists or um you know so like she puts them all together saying that these would be the basic components of what makes the more elaborate cave or patrons like a, a language of symbols or a language yeah. of science maybe not even symbols science is a better word yeah. it is but i mean when you actually do um, you know let, let, let's write a letter which could also be a rune okay this one. Um, I think we can probably all recognise that. Yeah, Hagel, Hagelos. H. Um, or, or it's H for house. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's still a sign and a symbol, isn't it? It is. We've called it an alphabet and we've called it a letter, but it's a symbol for a sound we make, which then has a meaning for us. Um, and so I see no reason why everything that she's finding isn't true. She's got quite a lot of people behind her, although, of course, she's always got the people who are going to be saying, no, 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 you can't have that. But she has got it. Yeah, she's got backing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we need to follow all of these lines of inquiry. And that's another thing today. We're so success obsessed and following obsessed. I feel it's very important to also follow those lines of inquiry that lead to a dead end, but it'll have very interesting side tracks. But also then we know that that is not the case. And I also believe that is what science is supposed to be. I know there are some, you know, famous, very famous quantum physicists or science have sort of said that science is only like an explanation or a story that works until it is disproven. And then you start on what things next. I mean, you will know that better to me, maybe from your husband. But science is not as set in stone as it is often presented to us. Science is always a journey of discovery. And really, good science always works against itself because science, in a way, is always looking to disprove itself. But then from that point, arrive at a, a theory that provides an even better understanding of what goes on in like, what we perceive as reality. Indeed, which we are actually doing right now in, because uh, I was saying to Imelda earlier, I'm a physics geek um, because of my husband who used to be a physicist. Um, but we're actually, there are, and it's a woman again, um, not that I'm feminist, um, that there's a woman who's actually doing stuff about what was there, be there before the Big Bang? Yeah, yeah. Do you and know her name? Really getting, re yeah. It's really getting real. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're not thinking, you know, beginning, middle, end. No, no, that's linear time. Yeah. And there, I mean, I don't think many really good physicists have ever thought it was linear time because it just doesn't, doesn't no, fit. It doesn't work. And, you know, every straight line curves if you follow it long enough. I mean, that's exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we, we Everything goes, and I mean, the cycles thing, which is in all of the, the old ways, all of the old traditions, is, is cycles in yeah. whatever country you like to go to. And very often, um, and this was one of the American tribes who was doing it particularly, and I can't remember which one, but it's not a circle, it's a spiral that yeah. moves out. Yeah which is what I was always taught as a kid. And then I discovered, uh, you know, somebody else was saying that. Went, oh, that's nice. It's on the side of the world too. And on YouTube somewhere, there is um, an animation, which is how our galaxy works and moves. And blow me, it works in a spiral. Yes. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And you start going, um. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we teach, both of us, I think, that this is cycles. Yes, 
the disciples, you know, that's room rate. We're talking about the rooms, so the cycles, they happen at the room rate. That's where the world is set in motion, and you get stories, and you get poetry, and you get music. So, yeah. Well, Ellen, I feel I've taken enough of your time. I think we need to bring it to a close for today. I uh, would love to talk to you again in the future if you can find the time yeah. for that. Many other topics we could cover. Is there any final words of wisdom you have for our audience today? Rewild your heart. Rewild your heart. Beautiful. I'm actually helping people do that. So if, you, if you're if you interested, contact me. Yeah, we can put your website or your contact details again in the show notes. So if yeah. you can click on there and get in touch with yeah. you. Because, you know, but rewild your heart. Don't care how you do it. Just rewild it. You know, rewild your heart and also rewild your life, I would say. Rewild your life. Okay. Rewild your heart and your life will be rewilded. <laughs> to follow. So... Thank you so much for your Thank time you. and for this dialogue. So everyone, we're going to close it here today. I will be back soon with podcast number nine, and that's going to be all about handmade paints, how are paints actually made. And as a painter, I'm really interested in that. So stay tuned. <laughs>